you have God's Word, if you would turn back with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. For those of you that uh, have not been here in a few weeks, uh, if you get a chance, you may want to go back and uh, pick up the first couple of uh, videos in this series. Uh, we're posting these sermons online, so you're welcome to go look at them anytime. Uh, is it firstbaptistlex.org? Is that it? No, rockhillbaptistlex.org. I would do that every time. So anyway, we'll get it right. <laughs> RockHillBaptistLex.org. Okay, that's the website. You should be able to go there and uh, be able to watch those videos. This is the third in the series. Next week will be the last. And to me, they just keep getting better and better. And uh, uh, in God's Word, in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, Peter writes this, The end of all things is at hand or near. Therefore... Every time you see that word, therefore, you need to stop and say something, something important is coming. I need to pay attention to what, what's being said. Jesus is about to come back or the coming of Jesus is near. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded or clear-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of the varied, or I like the word, manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks as one who speaks, oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God might be glorified through Jesus Christ to Him, to Jesus Christ, to Him be long glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, that's exciting, isn't it? The King is coming, folks. The King will be here one of these days. In light of the fact that Jesus might just come back this year, how should you and I as believers in Christ live? That's what Peter's talking about in this passage of Scripture. In the first century, there was a, a group called Qumran. It was a community. It was communal living. It came into existence because the Romans were ruling over the Jewish people. Now, when another nation rules over you, you have three options. One is you can choose to get along with the new rulers and follow their way of life and their lifestyle, which might compromise your convictions. So that's one way. And there were some in that first century that did that. The Sadducees primarily was a group that followed and uh, adhered to what Rome wanted to do. Uh, another thing you can do is be antagonistic against that group that's ruling. And you see uh, the Zealots were some of those that were trying to bring war against Rome and eventually ended up, because of their actions, ended up that Jerusalem was leveled to the ground in AD 70 and completely destroyed by the Roman uh, ruler Titus, or the Roman uh, general Titus. And the other way you can do, the other reaction you can have when a group is in control of you is just to completely absent yourself from the discussion. And that's what Qumran did. Qumran went up into the hills, uh, went up into the mountains, and they just disappeared. They let life go on by, and they had this communal living place. Uh, you may have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was that, the Qumran community were the ones responsible for having those scrolls hidden. Uh, and because of them, we have some a access to some manuscripts, ancient manuscripts that we would never have. But anyway, in that particular community that was governed by a set of rules, those people never let the blind, when they sat down to eat, there was never anybody, or even in the community, they would not let anybody who was blind or lame or sick in any kind of shape, form, or fashion, because they were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And they didn't feel like the, blame and the, line, the, the blind and the lame had any right or would have any place in God's new coming kingdom. And so they refused to let them participate. Well, at the same time that the Qumran community was going on, there was another man named Jesus that was preaching and teaching in the regions of Galilee and Judea. And Jesus was accused of being a friend of publicans and sinners. Hallelujah. Thank goodness that he's, he, he, he cared about us and he cares about us even while we're in our sinfulness. And Jesus said, when you give a feast... 
Invite the poor, the maimed, and the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. Jesus encouraged his followers to practice hospitality. In this particular passage we just read in verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Without grumbling. Because of the certainty of Christ's coming, the churches ought to be doing certain things. And that includes us. We should be self-controlled and clear-minded so that we can pray. We should love one another because love covers a multitude of sins. And we ought to practice hospitality. Why? Why do you and I need to engage in hospitality? Well, first of all, hospitality provides comfort and kindness in a chaotic and unkind world. Let me read that again. Hospitality provides comfort and kindness in a chaotic and an unkind world. In the early days of the church, we read about in the book of Acts, hospitality was really important. You had tra traveling missionaries, you had traveling evangelists who were going around proclaiming the gospel in the early stages of the church while it was being established. And those people had to have a place to stay when they traveled. Unfortunately, the inns of that day and time were kind of shady places that you really didn't want to be a part of. They were not very clean. They were not very well cared for. And so oftentimes they depended on the hospitality of God's people to give them a place to stay, a place to be warm, a place to be fed, all those kind of things. We have a story of that if you read in, in I think it's Acts chapter 17, 16 or 17, you read about Lydia. Lydia is in, in Philippi. Paul goes to Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke were all in Philippi. Paul goes one Sunday morning, evidently hearing about a place of prayer. He goes to the riverbank. There's a group of women there having a place of prayer. He proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ. And some people get saved. One of those people was Lydia. And Lydia basically begs and, and almost uh, compels Paul and his companions to take roof under her house. Now she had servants, which means she was wealthy. And so she had the means to be able to take care of Paul, but she didn't have to. Nobody had to practice hospitality. But God opened a door and they were able to stay with, with uh, Lydia for a long time. And Lydia's name is mentioned several times in the scriptures. She was a woman who practiced hospitality. You and I also need to practice hospitality. The, the scriptures time and time again tell us the importance of offering hospitality to others. In fact, Hebrews tells us some people have entertained angels without knowing about it by practicing hospitality. Would you like to, to entertain God's angels sometimes? You can do that sometimes when you practice hospitality. You and I need, we, you know, we live, in a, we, we live in a world that's a different context than the first century church. But we still live in a world where people are hurting. Folks, this is an unkind and uncaring world. You know, it's a cold and hard place sometimes. Isn't it good to receive comfort from somebody else when you're going through a difficult time? Isn't it great to be able to experience the love of Christ we live in a day and time when, unfortunately, even Christians have bought into this mentality where we're so material, we want more and more resources. And we want to keep them to ourselves. And so when we see people in need, we don't always reach out to them, do we? We don't always practice hospitality. I, I worked hard for my money. If they, want, if they want something, they go work hard for theirs too. Isn't that our attitude sometimes? Folks, what God's Word continually tells us is that God has blessed us so that you and I can be a blessing to somebody else. Folks, God owns all the cattle on a thousand hill. He owns the hills on which they stand and the world in which they, find, which they find themselves. God owns everything. We're simply stewards. We've been entrusted with resources so that we can be a part of God's kingdom. We need to practice hospitality. When you and I buy into materialism and we get, get so blinded by this materialistic lifestyle, we miss opportunities to share the love of Christ through hospitality. You see, hospitality is an outworking of the love that we talked about last week. It's a visible demonstration 
of what God has done for us in Christ. Hospitality can provide comfort and kindness to people who are in need. How can you and I practice hospitality today? Well, we can provide a place of rest. That's one of the things that the early church did was provided a place of rest where weary travelers, people would be going through town, people that, that were, were Christians, and uh, they didn't really have a lot of place to take. A lot of times they were ostracized by the ruling peoples, and uh, the Jewish people didn't like Christian missionaries, and so oftentimes they found themselves in a hard place. Well, what about today? We, we live at such a frantic pace, don't we? We run from one thing to the other, and uh, we had uh, my father-in-law celebrated 60 years in the gospel ministry yesterday, and his church had a special event for him, so we were in Missouri yesterday. In fact, Lisa's still there. But uh, we were over there visiting with them, and there were a lot of people that came and just expressed their appreciation for what Brother Ted had done and the way he had served the Lord. But there were a lot of people that didn't come. You know why? Because they were afraid it was going to be iced over. Now, I understand that. Of course, you don't want to get in the middle of that, do you? But it was a great expression of hospitality that they showed to my father-in-law yesterday. Because you and I, we need to provide a, a place of rest for people. We need to come alongside individuals and encourage them. How do you do that? What, how does that, what does that look like, preacher? Well, maybe you know somebody who's a single parent who doesn't get a lot of help from their spouse. And maybe they're trying to raise their kids all by themselves. And they're about to pull their hair out. Well, maybe you just ought to go babysit for them for a day. Now, isn't that practical? Isn't that something all of us can do? Uh, you know, maybe take their kids out and let, just let mom have the house to herself for a while. You know, do something to help those people. Uh, maybe you find somebody, and, you know, that you want to develop a relationship with. Well, go out to eat together. Maybe you can go Dutch streets. You don't have to pay for the other person's meal. Or maybe you can. Maybe you're financially capable of being able to pay for the meal. Just to get together, to be able to provide hospitality for somebody who's in need. You, can, you and I can provide a place of rest and a way of rest. We can provide food, as I just mentioned, for people. Uh, during biblical times, you know, people would come traveling through a place and somebody would say, come on over to my tent, prop your feet up, cool off a little bit, and I'll give you something cool to drink. Or if it's in the wintertime, they come in and get yourself warm by the fire and, and I'll give you some hot chocolate or something, you know. I don't know if they had hot chocolate back then or not, but it sounds good anyway, doesn't it? <laughs> Hospitality is one of the folks that one of the, the easiest things. And Rock Hill Baptist Church, we do a pretty good job with this on a corporate level. But sometimes on an individual level, we don't do as well. Uh, Christians also provided asylum for folks who were running from people like Saul of Tarsus, who was trying to kill all the Christians. And so oftentimes missionaries would find themselves running from government. You remember Paul, we've been talking about on Sunday night, we've been, we've been studying the book of uh, 2 Corinthians. And Paul had to leave Ephesus because some people brought charges against him and they were about to beat him to death. You know, and there were several times he was beaten and left for dead. And so there's a way to provide asylum. I remember uh, uh, we were in, uh, seminary students and there was a lady in our church who was being abused by her husband. And her children were also being abused by her husband. And she came to us frantic trying to get away from that situation. And we, provide, we let her stay in our apartment. We had a two-bedroom apartment with four of us, my two daughters and my wife and myself. We really didn't have enough place to have somebody in our home. But there was no way I was going to tell that lady that I wasn't going to help her out to try to get away from that situation. See, hospitality is really practical. Whenever you see a need, you have an opportunity to meet that need. God has blessed you. God has blessed all of us. I can take you to places where people don't have houses to live in. I can take you to Peru, where oftentimes the houses are four walls that have no windows. They have slots for windows, but they don't have any windows. They don't have any doors. They don't have any roof over top of them. Fortunately, it doesn't rain there very often. Sometimes, but not often. Uh, I can take you to other places where uh, people don't have food to eat. You know, God has blessed us with all kinds of material blessings. 
Folks, you and I need to share those material blessings with others. We need to come alongside them and, and help them out. Uh, hospitality, folks, has a place in our world today. The weariness and the tiredness of people, the struggles that they face, you and I can come alongside them and minister to them. Hospitality provides comfort and kindness in a chaotic and unkind world. Secondly, hospitality promotes connection and change for the kingdom of God. Hospitality provides connection and change for the kingdom of God. You know, something happens, doesn't it, when you invite somebody to your home? When you meet somebody at a restaurant? Something happens, doesn't it? You begin to develop relationships. You begin to develop friendships. You begin sometimes a friendship that will last a lifetime just by providing hospitality in your home. Uh, you can generally make an impact genuinely make an impact on somebody's life by having a meal with them, making connection with them. You know, don't, don't you think we live really disconnected lives in our world today, especially here in the United States? People are so busy. They run from one thing to the other. Their kids are involved in 15 different sporting activities or school activities, you know, uh, music activities. It can be all different kinds of activities. And because of that, you know, it's like, you know, I've, I've talked to some of our parents and, and, you know, they've got one kid over here having a ball game and one kid over here having a ball game. One parent goes over here. The other parent goes over there. Sometimes they got three kids and one kid just doesn't have a parent there that night because they're all doing something at the same time. And we live such disconnected lives. One of the things that hospitality does is help people connect with one another. It helps you connect with people. It helps them to connect with you. It helps them stop and slow down long enough to realize there's more to life than just running from thing to thing to thing. Hospitality helps to build connections. I, I remember people who've shown hospitality to us. I remember when we were in seminary and I was working three jobs. My wife was working a job. We had two small children and, and we didn't have money even to go out and eat. And we had some real good friends that lived a couple buildings down from us. And they just volunteered to keep our kids sometimes so Lisa and I could go out and buy a Coke because that's about all we could afford to buy at that point in time. We'd go buy a Coke and sit in the mall and just have a conversation without being interrupted by our babies, you know, our little ones. And that was a great blessing on us. I, I remember times when we didn't know how we were going to pay our bills. And we just say, Lord, you know, we've tried to be faithful to you. We're trying to honor you. We haven't really stepped outside of our bounds. We've managed our money well, but we still don't have the money to be able to take care of this bill. And I'd go to the post office, and the Lord would have laid on somebody's heart the, the fact that they needed to send us some money. And oftentimes it would be the exact same amount that we needed to be able to take care of that bill. Folks, that's a God thing. But it takes God's people willing to be hospitable, willing to share of the resources that God's entrusted. Uh, sometimes I've been able to be a blessing to somebody else, to pay a meal for somebody else, to buy a meal for somebody else, uh, to offer to keep somebody's kids. At least I've done that before where people can have a chance to go out and visit. Folks, hospitality is a way for us to connect with people. It's a way for us to become more like Jesus. What did Jesus major on when he was here on this earth? It wasn't building churches, was it? You know, what, was it, what, what did Jesus major on? He majored on making connections, building connections with one another. That's what Jesus majored on. You know, he said, I've got to go through Samaria. God had a, a God appointment for him. He had somebody he had to meet with, somebody he had to tell about who he was and about who God was and what God could do for their life. Jesus built connections. So when you and I build connections, we're being more like Jesus. Jesus also accepted hospitality from others. Sometimes we as Christians, we do better at giving than we do receiving, don't we? Let me just say this. When somebody wants to be a blessing, you don't tell them no. You rob them of a blessing. You may not need it, and that's okay. They may need to give it. It's not a matter of you and what you need. It's what they need to be doing in order to be obedient to Christ. We need to be recipients of God's blessings as well as giving God's blessings to others. Also, hospitality promotes change in God's kingdom. Think about how many people 
Jesus was able to have a conversation, a spiritual conversation with people after hospitality or during hospitality. I, I just as I was preparing this message, I was thinking of two specific instances. There was a guy named Simon, you remember, that invited Jesus to his home. And it was during that time that a woman came in and began to, to clean his feet and, and cry on his feet and use her hair to wipe off the dust and the dirt that was on his feet. And Jesus used that as an opportunity to talk to Simon about his relationship to God. I think of Zacchaeus. You remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Y'all know this song, right? <laughs> now y'all going to be singing that the rest of the day. I'm glad I was able to do something that y'all going to remember today. <laughs> but Z Jesus looked up at Zacchaeus and tree and says, Zacchaeus, I need to go to your house today to have something to eat. And during that conversation, Zacchaeus' life was radically changed by Jesus Christ. Because Jesus accepted, not only did he give hospitality, but Jesus accepted hospitality from other people. You know, if this is the year that Jesus might come back, shouldn't we be building relationships and making connections that will help people's lives be changed? by the power of our God. You know, somebody said, people don't want to know how much you know until they know how much you care. Y'all have heard that saying before, and that's true. You and I need to come alongside people. We need to make, be intentional about building relationships, about giving hospitality, so that people's lives can be changed for God's kingdom. You know, the Bible offers many examples of hospitality, but none more precious to me than uh, Mary. You remember Mary who had seven demons inside of her and Jesus cast out those demons? Mary was absolutely heartbroken when she heard that Christ was going to the cross. Jesus is sitting with some gentlemen. And Mary comes in and she takes a very expensive box of perf a bottle of perfume worth about a year's wages. Probably her dowry for her getting married. That's typically what happened. She had no intention of just pouring a little bit on Jesus, did she? The Bible said that she literally broke the vase. She wouldn't plan on keeping any of it. And she poured it all over the head of Jesus. Everybody was jealous and said, Lord, she should have given that, sold, that, sold that perfume and given the money to help the poor. You remember what Jesus said? Leave her alone. She's done a good thing to me. She's done this to anoint me for my burial. An act of hospitality. Pouring out her life, really, her life savings. She poured it out on Jesus. A great act of hospitality. Guys, I'm convinced that because the days are tough and the end is near, you and I need to be practicing hospitality. We need to be building relationships. Relationships that we can use to minister to one another as believers in Christ, minister to our brothers and sisters in Christ, but also minister to those people who out there who don't know Christ, who are hurting, that need to know who Jesus is. And oftentimes they won't listen to you if you just walk up and knock on their door. But after you minister to them, and after you provide hospitality to them, and you, they know that you care about them as an individual first and foremost, they're a lot more receptive to listening what you, about who you know and about your Savior. Before Jesus returned to heaven, He prepared His disciples for the end of times. There were some, like the Qumran community, that isolated themselves just waiting for Jesus to come back. There were some, you remember, that Paul wrote about that they thought the end was near, so they just decided they were going to sell all their assets and go sit up on the hill and wait for Jesus to come back. And Paul chided them, saying, you need to get busy working. If you don't work, you ought not eat. That's what he says, and that's in relation to that context. Folks, you and I have been greatly blessed by God. If the end is near, and I believe it is, the King is coming. It may be today before this day's over with. It may be this year before this year's over with. Shouldn't you and I be practicing hospitality? Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, for the day that you've given to us. Father, thank you for these clear words about how we can express 
authentic love of our Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, as we come to this time of invitation, as your Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts today, Lord, I pray that you will convict us where we need to be convicted. Father, you would encourage us where we need to be encouraged. And you would challenge us where we need to be challenged. But Father, most importantly, I pray if there's somebody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, Father, this day would not pass, this hour would not pass before they came to know you as personal Lord and Savior of their life. Lord, as your Holy Spirit speaks to hearts today, I pray that we'll not do anything, Lord, to quench your Spirit in our own souls or in somebody else's life. And Lord, I pray it and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a believer in Christ, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, let me just ask you this. Are you practicing hospitality? If not, why? Jesus did. Should we not practice hospitality? Should we not reach out and minister to other people? Are you so afraid of losing a few dollars that you're unwilling to help people who are in need? Let me just remind you, you don't own any of that. You think you do. What happens when you die? Can't take it with you. Tells me you don't really own it. God's just entrusted it to you. And God wants His stewards to be found faithful. Don't let materialism get a, get a grip on your heart to where you can't open your heart in loving kindness to other people. If you're a believer in Christ and you're not doing what you know God wants you to do, and if the Holy Spirit is convicting you this morning, be obedient to Him. Decide to turn over a new leaf. Some of you don't practice hospitality. It's not hard. Bake a batch of cookies and take it to your next door neighbor. Knock on the door and say, here. And turn around and go home. That's hospitality, you know. If they ask you why, just say, well, God loves me and God's blessed me and I want to be a blessing to you. That, can anybody not do that? All of us can, can't we? Hospitality is not hard. It just takes intentionality. We've got to be intentional in doing it. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, let me just say this. God loves you. He loves you just like you are. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to pull yourself out of the pig pen to get to God. God reaches down to you right where you are. And he says, if you will repent of your sin and ask my forgiveness and accept my lordship in your life, you can be saved today. If that's a decision that you need to make, in just a moment we're going to have a hymn of invitation. I'm going to stand right down here and just say, come up to me and say, Preacher, I want to know this Jesus. I want him to be a part of my life. I want him to make a difference in me. He's made a difference in so many people's lives. He's made a difference in my life. And He can make a difference in yours. Whatever decision that God's laid upon your heart, would you be faithful to honor Him and do what He's asking you to do? Let's stand together and sing. Adam?